All right, thank you again for joining us today. My name is Linda Hall from Connect to Community and I wanna introduce our speakers for today. Teresa Parks is the Deputy Director of the Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission, as well as Director of the Commission's Human Rights Authority. She holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana and is a national certified guardian through the Center for Guardianship Certification. She's also a graduate of Illinois' Partner in Policymaking Program and the Institute of Special Education Advocacy through William and Mary Law School. Prior to working for the commission, she was a nursing home ombudsman and program director for a community mental health agency. Currently, Teresa serves on the board and education committees of the Illinois Guardianship Association, is an appointed member of the Illinois Council on Developmental Disabilities, and is a trustee for the Center for Guardianship Certification. She has presented at a number of state and national conferences, including numerous presentations on supported decision making, and is the parent of two adult children, including a son with disabilities. Erin Compton is a senior in high school, taking classes through the Illinois Virtual School and Academy. She is a member of the State Rehabilitation Council. Erin loves dancing and she competes in rhythmic gymnastics for Special Olympics. She's a huge sports fan and she plays on a special hockey league and works for the Chicago Cubs through the Angels for Hire program. Her mom, Diane Compton, is a member of the Illinois Council on Developmental Disabilities and a Partners in Policymaking graduate. In addition to Erin, she has two other adult children. She has a master's in communication from Northwestern University and is one of the moderators of the iPad Facebook group. I added that, Erin, because, or Diane, because it's very important. Her hobbies include, and this is my favorite, filling out SSI paperwork, finding ways of doing things that others say can't be done, and taking long drives to doctor's appointments and activities. And we as parents can all relate to that, Diane. So thank you for that. So please help me welcome all of our speakers for today. Thank you very much. I, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Uh, and I'm gonna start out by asking Erin to take the first slides. Let's start with that one. American history, English, math, and physical education. I love studying about history and learned that one of my ancestors fought in both the Revolutionary War and in the Civil War. In the Battle of Savannah, an instrument was marching to the sea. Getting and giving support is natural. Hi. Okay. Can I ask everybody to please mute aside from our speakers? I am 19 years old. I am currently serving on the Illinois State we have Rehabilitation Council. I love being paid for the day with Patty Bellock. I would like a job in government representing people with disabilities. I'm also interested in law enforcement, disability history, family history, and dancing. I have been dancing since I was a few months old. I also dance with expressing dance and I worked with Jess Daniels to choreograph a dance on discrimination. I also danced at Um, 14 Disability Futures, Chicago of June 2022. Care Balance, Chicago in September. 
2022 through 2023. Joffrey Nutcracker, Chicago, on my birthday, 2022. And I just came back with, from Simstrata, Amsterdam, August 2023. I also play on the Chicago Blackhawks special hockey team. Thank you, Erin, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as people learn about uh, your life and how your family has incorporated supported decision making, I'm going to now cover some of the less interesting uh, technical items uh, and tell you a little bit about the, the legislation known as the Supported Decision Making Act. Uh, it was the agency I work for, the Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission, that initiated uh, the legislative proposal that became the Supported Decision Making Act. And I want to start out by giving you just a little uh, background on the legislation as well as our agency. Uh, the Guardianship and Advocacy Commission is a state agency. We have offices across the state of Illinois as designated by the stars in this map. All of our programs support people with disabilities. And these are our various programs. We are the state guardian in Illinois for adults with disabilities, and we're considered the guardian of last resort, which means we don't get appointed guardian unless the court somewhere in the state determines someone needs a guardian and there's really no one else willing, available, or appropriate to serve as that individual's guardian. We are guardian for about 5,000 individuals across the state of Illinois. We also put forth information uh, on our website about adult guardianship, should anyone have questions, and we sponsor a guardian training module for newly appointed guardians, which is now a requirement uh, for newly appointed guardians here in the state unless uh, the court waives that requirement. We also have a legal advocacy service that provides legal advice, representation for people with disabilities, both children and adults. Most often our attorneys in that program are representing individuals who are facing some type of involuntary mental health proceedings, such as involuntary commitment to a mental health facility or court ordered treatment, usually psychotropic medication treatment. Our attorneys represent those individuals much like public defenders would, except our attorneys Attorneys have a great deal of expertise expertise in mental health law, just to help ensure that they get their due process protections during those proceedings. Our attorneys are also a, available to help out, uh, help individuals fill out what um, uh, advanced directives like powers of attorney, including a unique power of attorney called a mental health treatment declaration, which is very specific to mental health services. Our human rights authority investigates uh, allegations of rights violations committed against people with disabilities by disability service providers. We go into all kinds of settings from state operated facilities to group homes, vocational programs, mental health uh, facilities, uh, uh, mental health community centers, um, as well as special ed programs, nursing homes, and even jails, because sometimes people with disabilities um, interface with the criminal justice system. And we work with those entities that we investigate to make um, improvements uh, if we do find a substantiated rights violation. And what's unique about this program that I want to quickly mention is that um, this program is primarily staffed by volunteers. People donate their time uh, to serve Serve on regional boards where we have staff who facilitate the investigations, but uh, the individuals who serve on the boards are from their, the communities and our citizens, our people with disabilities, or family members with disabilities. And it, anyone that's out there who might be interested in this type of volunteer role, uh, we'd love to hear from you. 
Uh, finally, we have our special education uh, advocacy division, which is a collaboration of our legal advocacy service, our human rights authority, and we help Illinois families with uh, issues regarding special education. Um, we provide training, we provide advocacy, we can assist with IEP meetings, and we also have an attorney and a paralegal uh, who can handle some mediation and due process cases. Under our enabling uh, legislation that created our agency, we can also recommend legislation. And this happens most often when th through one of our programs, we encounter a gap, maybe a gap in services, gap in rights protections, uh, the need to clarify the law. And that's really kind of what happened with the supported decision-making proposal. We um, have a lot of experience in the guardianship world uh, uh, and understand that sometimes people get appointed guardians when they may not need a full-fledged guardian. We were hearing a lot from family members whose um, children with disabilities were reaching the age of 18 and they felt pressure oftentimes by a special ed program to pursue guardianship at age 18 when the families may not have felt like uh, the, the, their child needed a full-fledged guardianship, but there was really no other option. So we did a lot of research on other state statutes uh, on supported decision making, incorporated uh, some of those elements into uh, our proposal. Um, the legislation quickly passed through the House and Senate, was signed into law by the governor in 2019. 2021, excuse me, and the legislation became effective in February of 2022. The Supported Decision Making Act starts out with an overall stated purpose to recognize a less restrictive alternative for adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities who need assistance with decisions regarding daily living. So a couple of key words I want to point out is this legislation, this act only applies to adults age 18 and older, and only at this time to adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities. It's intended to be an alternative to guardianship for individuals uh, who just need a little bit of assistance with decision making like we all do from time to time. The difference is the act provides some structure as well as some protections for people with disabilities. The act covers a lot of uh, different areas. It, it starts out with some guiding principles, a presumption of capacity statement. It describes what a supporter can and cannot do. Contained within the act is a model supported decision-making agreement, which according to the act must be substantially followed. It, it, it addresses how supporters can help individuals access information about decisions. It describes ways in which a, an agreement can be ended, and it incorporates resources for reporting abuse, neglect, and exploitation should that become a concern. And here's just a very basic description of how it works. Um, the adult with intellectual or developmental disabilities uh, who is called a principal under the act identifies another trusted adult to be their supporter. It might be a relative, it might be a friend. And that supporter is to assist in certain areas of life that the principal decides. It might be help with medical, decisions, help with financial decisions, uh, assistance with living arrangements or work-related matters. Those arrangements are put into a written supported decision-making agreement that both the supporter and the principal sign in front of two other adult witnesses. And then the supporter simply helps the principal with decisions in those identified areas of support. And this is very key, the principal still makes all the final decisions. And even when there's a supported decision-making agreement in place, the principal, the person with disabilities can act independent of that agreement if they so choose. Erin's gonna tell us a little bit about some of the guiding principles listed in the act. Erin? Guiding principles of the supported decision-making act. All adults should be able to live in a matter of one's own choosing. All adults should be able to participate in decisions 
regarding their own lives, adults who need assistance should receive the most effective and least intrusive assistance when providing assistance to another. The person's values, beliefs, cultural transitions should be respected. Perception of capacity statement, the supported decision-making act says that all adults have the ability to make their own decisions unless otherwise decided by a court. Ability is not afforded simply because of a person's disability, the manner in which a person communicates. So um, I am here as the parent uh, in this relationship. I am a supporter. And the first thing I want to say is that we are not here to say everyone should do this or to make anyone feel bad if they've chosen guardianship. This is just another tool that as a parent, we've been so grateful for. But, um, you know, I just don't want to, anyone to think that we're saying this is the only way to do things. Um, so with that, so supported decision-making ship versus guardianship, our journey, um, we have really used a lifelong focus on self-determination and, and decision-making. Even from the time Erin was born, we, our motto was as independent as possible, and we tried to live to that. So it's not something that she turned 18 and we were like, cool, you know, she's ready to go on her own. It's something we'd really worked for. And we were so grateful that um, the Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission had pursued this uh, legislation right when we needed it. What are the odds of that? So we are very happy with it. Um, we The other thing we've done that I think has really helped is we've focused on getting Erin the best education possible. Um, the school has spent a lot of time on coin countings and circle squares and triangles. But what I really need her to do if she's going to be independent is understand decimals and understand that a hundred is not the same as a thousand is not the same as ten dollars, especially as we move more and more into e-banking. So we've really, really focused on, you know, just really we've used the um, Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission's special ed group as well, which I highly recommend. Uh, just to really make sure she's getting the basis that she needs to make some of these decisions. Okay. Um, the other thing we've done is worked with the Illinois Assistive Technology Program and identified technology that can be used to help her gain independence. So e-banking makes things so much easier for that. It, it can, I mean, I don't know if anybody remembers having to balance the checkbook and it never worked and it was just a lot. We're now with e-banking, some things have gotten a lot more intuitive and easy to use, but we just need to make sure she has that access too. Speech to text and text to speech, the slides you saw in the beginning, she, Erin actually created those with speech to text. So again, really helping that and there's a pen reader so that if you are at a bank or somewhere and you need to fill out a form, you can use this pen reader to help you with a word you might not know. So that's been really valuable too. And I love the quote from Judy Human that independent living is not doing things by yourself, it's being in control of how things are done. And that also is a very much a guiding force for us. I know I personally would not want to do everything by myself. I'm glad to have a lot of people that that pitch in and give me advice. So um, that's the model we're trying to recreate for Erin. My cabinet checks and balances. Supported decision making makes me feel comfortable with myself. I consider my supporters my cabinet. 
They are my experts who help me live my life. I use that advice to make the best, to be the best leader I can be, just like the president does. So my role as a cabinet member or as a supporter is to advise, respect, advocate for her decisions, facilitate communication if needed, ensure she have dignity of risk in all that she does, and create a financial plan with her agreement that keeps her money and herself safe. So this is a big thing. And I know I was worried about this as a parent. Um, if we can go, oh yeah, okay, sorry, it flashed. Um, you know, money is scary and there's so many people out there that are more than happy to help you separate from your money. Uh, anytime you answer the phone, you're probably talking to one of those people sometimes. So we have really worked to stress that her money is her money and she may get upset with us and we may do something that doesn't she doesn't agree with, but the money is separate, right? That's something that has to stay out of any arguments um, as well as eventually she, I'm sure, will fall in love and have a relationship. But that also has to, her money is hers. Uh, and eventually maybe it's shared, but for now she needs to keep that herself. So we've really tried to educate her on that. Did it work? Yeah. It did. Okay, so good. Um, and then I think I had a, an example this weekend and, and every day really, but one of the examples that struck me this weekend was we were at an event and I really wanted her to get a picture of her and her friend and it would have been a adorable and so cute Aaron didn't want it and I was like come on come on you know it's parents so I'll give you a slurpee whatever this is gonna like this is gonna be the picture and again she said no and then I had to step back and say okay she has communicated what her choice is if I don't respect that who will so and I am her supporter so I have the obligation to respect that so it's been a really good model for me as a parent to kind of get out of that parent role a little bit because <laughs> that's, I mean, I'm there for my 27 year old too. So um, it's really helped me let go. And, um, and, and I just appreciated for that. Okay. Now we can. Oh, and also the other thing I want to stress is so often we get into, well, it's, got to be based on ability. Erin has a lot of abilities. I bet it works for her, but nobody else. But an example I wanted to share is our friend Alex, and I do have his permission. Um, so, and he is nonverbal, but he ha has, this was a quote we had from him. Uh, and he, again, gave us permission to use it. Self-determination means I can make decisions based on my own opinion, not someone else's. Self-determination is important to me. I have a lot of self-determination. It is good to be able to make your own choices. Self-determination is hard when my choice isn't an option, when the right choice is the hard choice, and when the right choice is unpopular. And isn't that true for all of us? I thought, wow, he really narrowed in what took me a lot of years to learn. And self-determination can also help me accomplish a lot. We have another friend who really taught me everything I needed to know in a preschool class of all places when Erin was three about self-determination. And she would have the little three-year-olds running to the, the washroom in the church. It was very safe. We were the only ones there. And I was like, oh my gosh. But she has always challenged me for self-determination and letting Erin be her own person. But they felt that guardianship would be a better choice for them right now. They might consider moving and they're hoping to be able to move to a supported decision-making, but for right now, they're, they've they chose guardianship. So again, it's not something that you have to feel bad about or uh, concerned. It's just another option that if it works, it can really, really help with a lot of things. Okay. Okay, so and the duties, again, I touched a little bit 
assist with understanding information about a decision. I do a lot of this in IEP meetings because you've got a lot of people yelling at different things. Well, we do, unfortunately. Um, and so just kind of helping her understand, okay, this is what you're making a decision on. Making sure that the school isn't swaying her in some of those decisions that they have in mind. Um, helping access information about a decision. She's actually very good with Google, but you know, is there anything we need to do to look and, um, and understand all the information you need? Assist with appointments. Oh my goodness, I wish I had a supporter who did our scheduling, but sadly that is my job. And so I do my best on that one. And she has grace for me. <laughs> uh, track services. Again, we've been spending the last year applying for SSI. I am at my limit of capability in getting that done. So um, that is something that I have on my supporter plate. And determining the principal's decision, assisting with communicating those decisions, and advocating for the principal's wishes and decisions. Um, so again, the school example, she did not want to give up her rights, uh, which is what happens at 18. The students are supposed to sign a form. Everyone does it. Well, she didn't want to do that. And so I was able to, again, working with uh, Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission and just saying, okay, do we have to do it? Well, it turns out they do have an agreement that you can use that Sort of gives up your rights, but not really. But we didn't even go that route. We just held strong and Erin was able to retain her rights. Um, so that's also another piece is that the Illinois IGAC is just amazing. And if you do go this route, you will not be alone. They are there to help. Uh, they just, I can't even say enough about them. They, they call back right away. They respond to emails. So if you take that chance or if you're even researching it and you need information, they are just extremely helpful. Whoops, did I? Supporter access your information. A supporter can only, can only access information with the principal's consent and as approved under the agreement, the supporter must keep information private. The principal can still access information without support, without, without the support. Releases of information may be needed for a supporter to access information. Thank you, Diane and Erin. And it's very likely uh, that the supported decision-making agreement alone will not suffice to access uh, information. Um, we understand that. So um, many times agencies will want um, the principal to actually sign a release of information that would allow the supporter to access information. And that release of information um, should list the specific types of information that the supporter can access. And uh, it has to be signed by the principal and it should also be witnessed uh, in order to be um, uh, carried out. And it's we recommend uh, that someone other than the supporter serve as the witness. And we have created two sample releases of information of forms that are available on our agency website. One release is specifically for school-related records, and, and then the other release is for uh, anything else. And you can get these and download and print them from our website and use them. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the Act says uh, supporters cannot do, some of the prohibitions. 
Uh, and these include the supporter cannot exert undue influence or force a decision. They can't make a decision for the principal under the act. They can't access information. Um, unless authorized by the principal or the supported decision-making agreement. They can't access information unrelated to an identified area of support. So say the agreement says that um, the supporter can assist with decisions regarding medical care. That's it. Uh, and if that's the case, then the supporter couldn't access information about the individual's finances, for example, only to the area, only information related to the area of support. Also, the supporter can't be paid for being a supporter and they can't work for the principal, such as in a, a personal care worker situation, unless they are immediate family. In terms of who, who can and cannot be a supporter, uh, a supporter can't be a, a current service provider, a current teacher involved uh, in the principal's education or life. They cannot be a person who is an employee or employer of the principal unless immediate family. They can't be a person providing paid support services such as a personal care worker, again, unless their immediate family um, and, and we wanted to make sure that ex exception existed because we know some family members are paid to be personal workers and we didn't want them to be disqualified from being a supporter. They also can't be a person who works for an agency financially responsible for the care of the principal or a person who's listed on the Department of Public Health's uh, health care registry as a person who has a finding of abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. They also can't be a person who has a court order prohibiting contact with the principal, such as an order of protection. And they can't be a person who has certain convictions, criminal conv convictions, such as a sex offense, aggravated assault, fraud, theft, forgery, or extortion. So who might be a, a supporter? Could be a parent, an adult sibling, another adult relative, uh, like an aunt, uncle, a family friend, a former teacher, for example, could also be uh, a potential supporter. Once a supporter is named, there should be certain ways in which the supporter um, continually involves the principal. For example, the supporter should always make sure that the principal understands exactly what they are doing on their behalf. And if they do obtain information regarding a decision, they should share it directly with the principal. Also, both the supporter and the principal should let any involved service providers know about the supported decision-making arrangement, stressing that the final decisions uh, rest in the hands of the principal. And as much as possible, uh, this, the principal should be present when the supporter gathers information or when decisions are communicated. I have here a sample supported decision-making agreement. We took the language out of the act and created a standalone uh, document that's available on our agency website for downloading and printing. And agencies who receive a copy of this uh, must follow it uh, unless the principal, the person with disabilities tells them otherwise. The uh, document, the supported decision-making agreement starts out on page one with some uh, definitions of what a supporter and principal are. It also includes some overarching um, uh, requirements that the supporter act in good faith and act within the authority of the agreement, that they act loyally uh, and without self-interest, and that they avoid conflicts of interest. Page one also requires the supporter to list their contact information. Page two is kind of the meat of the agreement. This is where the um, various areas of support are listed, um, including uh, assistance with obtaining food, clothing, shelter, helping with medical decisions or, or uh, counseling, helping with financial affairs, applying for public benefits, helping with work-related matters, assisting uh, with residential services, helping with school-related matters. If, if the um, principal is still in school at age 18, um, 
the supporter might be uh, assisting with school related matters, uh, helping to advocate for uh, the principal. And then we've got a blank line here for anything else. Now the um, principal might initial one area, they might initial a couple of areas, or they might initial all of the areas as indication of um, needing the supporter's assistance in these various areas. For those areas that the, the principal does not want the supporter's assistance, they would just mark NA for not applicable. Uh, the middle part of page two stresses that the supporter does not make decisions for the principal, but here are the things the supporter can do. They can help access information about a decision, they can help understand options around a decision, or they might help communicate a decision if needed. Um, and this that's just so anyone who receives uh, any provider who would receive a copy of the agreement, again, understand what this, the supporter's role is and what they can and cannot do. The bottom part of page uh, two talks about accessing information, but again, a separate release of information will likely be required. The last page of the agreement is the signature page. This is uh, where the principal and the supporter both sign in front of two other adult witnesses. And then at the bottom of page three is um, information about abuse, neglect, uh, exploitation reporter. Should someone receive a copy of the agreement and observe some concerns they might have regarding the principal supporter role. We have tried to build in safeguards um, to protect the choices, the decisions of the principal, uh, and hopefully protect against any potential abuse. Uh, first of all, the legislation, the act emphasizes, uh, as does the agreement, that the principal makes all the final decisions. The agreement documents the areas of support uh, that the supporter can provide. And the legislation also talks specifically about the duties that a supporter can provide form and it's very limited to gathering information, help uh, discuss uh, the decision and options around a decision and help communicate decisions if needed. Also, um, the act specifies the disqualifications. You know, not everyone can be a supporter. And so we've made it very clear who can and cannot, who cannot be a supporter. And finally, um, the act also includes provisions for the agreement to be ended at any time. The principal can do that. And here are the various ways in which a principal can end an agreement. They can simply tear it up. They can ask someone else to tear it up in their presence. They can sign and date a statement that they are ending, terminating the, the agreement, or they can tell uh, two people uh, that they want to end the agreement. The agreement would automatically end if there's a finding of abuse, neglect, or exploitation by the supporter, or if there is a restraining order against the supporter by the principal. The supporter can also end the agreement by simply giving notice to the principal, and we recommend a two-week notice just in case the um, principal needs to line up a backup supporter. We have a host of resources available on our agency website um, on supported decision making. We have a brochure. We have training uh, that was developed with the help of the Self-Advocacy Alliance uh, for people with disabilities. We have training for supporters that issues a certificate at the end. We have fact sheets. We have that standalone a model supported decision making agreement the sample releases of information and a frequently asked question sheet. Uh, I've included the link here to our webpage on supported decision-making as well as a link to the National Center for Supported Decision-Making. Okay, so hopefully uh, you have a better understanding a little bit. Teresa is always so good at explaining this and it is very simple to set up. I almost was afraid they see a question coming about legally binding. Yes, it is. 
but it doesn't feel like it, especially when we're so used to the disability world where we have to sign and, oh my gosh, the, the paperwork. So this feels almost too easy, but um, they did not have, they don't even require that it be notarized because there was concern that could prevent someone who doesn't have access to a notary from creating this agreement. So it is very easy to institute. The complications come in, in practice. So I think what we've done, again, getting started as early as possible, Erin went through the training that Teresa talked about. We have really created that as a thing. Um, and Erin understands that she, even though she legally can just rip up that agreement, it has to be something really, really terrible to do that with. So it's that education piece, I think. And if you can get, if your person, your principal can understand that this is adulthood, this is their responsibility for keeping safe as well then it can really be very powerful. You know, in situations, my other daughter, for instance, I shouldn't be saying this on recording, but very dramatic. Uh, she doesn't have a disability, but, um, you know, if we would try to put this in place with her at 18, yeah, we'd be on our 797th agreement because she would have very dramatically ripped it up and thrown it aside. Um, you know, so that... We had to, again, explain to Aaron that the finances and the, the agreement here are part of being an adult. She has that responsibility now. She also has more responsibility to keep herself safe. So if you can just really get through that, it, it is a really incredible opportunity that we've, do you enjoy it? Yeah. What's your favorite part? I'm having you in the boss again. Erin enjoys being the boss. So <laughs> that's uh, um, my advice there is to just really like at 18, then all of a sudden say, okay, you have these decisions and we don't have any control of you. It's not going to probably work real well. But if you build up to that and really go through things, we also went through guardianship and said, okay, this is the other side of things. Um, is that what you want or can you, can you be responsible and mature enough to put this into place? Um, so that I think is really key in making this successful. Um, we also do have like, we, she has an ABLE account. We haven't really ventured into her pulling money out yet. It just hasn't really happened. Um, and so we'll need to cross that bridge, but we have like savings that is safe and that is not money she can just go into. So I saw a chat pop up that um, the financial decisions and other people in putting too much influence on them and saying, oh yeah, I'd love a thousand dollars. Can you give me that? Which again, huge fear. But we've tried to create safety for most of the money. Like it's in money she can't quite access unless she truly needs it, which we do for ourselves too, right? You have your money in your checking account and then you have your savings and then you might have a longer term savings account. So that's what we've created. So even if it, things did go wrong, that it wouldn't be her whole nest egg that would be at risk. And that brings us to the whole dignity of risk situation. That again, and for any parent, is very difficult to, to think about and to watch happen. But we all learn from the mistakes we make. Uh, I see certainly relationships that go wrong. You learn just as much from them and what you should or shouldn't allow and how people should treat you as you do from relationships that are wildly successful. And it's not our job to prevent someone from learning those experiences. So 
it's but it is difficult and i am the president of the helicopter parents club if anyone would like to join so my saying this is not like <laughs> from a pedestal this is me in the trenches also working through it all uh and but like i said earlier the the agreement has almost it's helped me it's been very good for me to get out of that helicopter role so did you want to add? Oh, okay. <laughs> do you want to add anything here? Yes, I love support decision making. It really is a life changer for my mom and I. Um, would you like to go through the questions in the chat? I can field them for you if you'd like. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. And Yes, we did record the event, just for the person who was asking that. Um, a lot of impressive uh, people with you, Erin. And like I say, following your posts on Facebook and your mom's posts on Facebook about all the things that you do, you are a very impressive young woman. So congratulations to you and to your family for that. Um, okay, can supported decision-making work in conjunction with powers of attorney for medical and or property that may already be in place? So um, this question comes up periodically, uh, powers of attorney, I think, um, and I'm not an attorney, so uh, let me preface my comments with that. What we have heard some people looking at is having a supported decision-making agreement in the present. However, having establishing a power of attorney in the future, should the individual need more assistance and become incapacitated uh, for decision-making so that you would avoid guardianship whatsoever. So you have the supported decision-making agreement in place now for the here and now and uh, power of attorney in the future um, should the individual need that level of support. And and again, like, like I said, that would kind of avoid guardianship uh, that whole world, uh, if you had those two things in place, working in conjunction, I, you know, I, 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 I believe our attorneys have indicated that that could work out uh, in some ways, but I don't know the technical. And and if someone would like more information about that, I can certainly uh, get that information. Um, any known impacts and other decisioning or benefits that are negatively impacted by support decision making or other things that families should consider? You know, um, I, I, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Diane. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I'm sure Teresa has the, uh, the legal piece of it, but um, I was very, very worried about SSI. And I had heard horror stories, even attorneys were telling me that uh, if, the, if, they, if you didn't have guardianship, you couldn't get SSI. That has not been our case at all. Uh, I just mentioned we have supported decision-making. They do require Aaron to be on the call and so you know, to give permission for them to talk to me. But that, uh, I mean, other than SSI, it has been a true nightmare, but not for that reason. It has... <laughs> uh, there were they had all kinds of other problems, but that has never been an issue. So, um, you know, she was pulled from puns recently. So far, that has not been an issue. So I just I think so far it's been okay that way. The only um, problem that I've heard about from the field uh, from a parent who is supporter for um, her son was over a, a, like a medical insurance claim and the insurance company questioned the supported decision-making agreement. They weren't familiar with the act, um, but when she provided a copy of the agreement, the releases of information and an actual copy of the act, it's not that long, um, that, then they, um, they understood and it, everything worked out fine. And she was able to help with the, that insurance claim. And I think you touched on this, but is supported decision-making in place of powers of attorney or can it be in addition to powers of attorney? 
Yeah, and 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 in terms of usually powers of attorney come into play when um, someone becomes incapacitated and they can no longer manage their affairs. So so in supported decision making, the person is still able to make and and participate in their decisions. So um, typically, you could have the the agreement in place in the here and now, and then the power of attorney for the future. Um, but I, there may be a possibility of maybe having a, a power of attorney over finances while also having a supported decision-making agreement. But again, I'm not an attorney and I, I, I would be reluctant to advise in that area. Uh, my son is his own guardian and this seems to be, to be good for him is Erin, her own guardian. Um, well, we just have the supported decision-making so I don't know if there's a step where they can be declared their own guardian, but I guess, I mean, we haven't taken any guardianship away. So I think the answer is yes, unless someone can clarify. Um, yeah, right now, I I do know that um, guardianship uh, is guardianship and, and you wouldn't have a supported decision-making agreement within a guardianship, at least right now. I, I, I do know some states have looked at that concept of initiating a supported decision-making agreement within uh, a guardianship and then eventually help the individual get out of guardianship. Um, we're looking at a legislative proposal that would allow the courts to look at that as an option, but right now in Illinois, that's not how it's set up. Because I do think a lot of families who have guardianship over their loved one still do try to allow that yeah. person, whether their child, whatever, to make as many decisions as possible for them that they are capable of doing. It's just kind of, you know, a safety net for things. And maybe that goes into the next question. And it's kind of directed to you, Diane. Uh, the question is, my fear is the pressure of someone outside of the supporter or the cabinet who pushes my son to make bad decisions. He is 20 and communicates well, but can be swayed by others' emotions. Money handling is also not so good or some things, sorry, I got my thing covered up here, some things that require good analysis. Um, the last concern, if he is presented with decisioning when I am not there, what does that look like? Right. Yes. And that's every parent. I could have written that question myself. So, um, so you're not alone. Uh, I, like I said, our finances, we haven't really given her access to a lot of money. And I think a lot of that is just, it was COVID and none of us were going anywhere. So it wasn't really an issue. And so we do need to kind of address that, <clears throat> but we do have, uh, a special needs trust, which again, that's money that's there but she can't really touch we she has an able account now we're again just kind of limiting the exposure of the money that can go so if she can have two thousand dollars that she can play around with that's what we would be willing to like put at risk i guess and give the dignity of risk over but still having those protections i mean i answered um you know how this but you get the the calls that you get the, the marketing and they said is this diane and i said yes i was like shoot because i know you're not supposed to say yes when the, the people call you and i just did so i mean we all can make those mistakes and then i spent the next two months in fear and looking at my you know, did i just give them access to all my money uh, it's a scary thing out there and um you know a friend evidently people in prison somehow had gotten a list of people with disabilities and her daughter started getting a pen pal from someone in prison. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's that kind of thing that keeps us all up at night. But if you can, again, educate your person, really give them that responsibility and say, okay, it's your responsibility to keep it safe. And if you make a wrong decision, there's nothing I can do to to fix that. I mean, that is going that is the responsibility that you have to take, and and kind of the the perhaps downside for them uh, is that they do have to step up to that responsibility. So just limiting if you can have an account, and I know SSI, we haven't again. That's another reason we're like no one spend any money because um, we're trying to get through SSI. But 
just figuring out how you can protect them with traditional protections that we all use, savings accounts versus um, checking accounts kind of thing. Um, so Erin talked about her cabinet. So how many supporters can you have at the same time? And what's the process for changing them? You know, whether someone, you know, as I think we all think about when we age as parents and when we are no longer either able to help or here to help. What does that look like in terms of the country? Sure. Yeah, yeah, you can have more than one. There's nothing in the act that would prohibit uh, an individual from having more than one supporter. We would just recommend that they have maybe um, a distinct role for each supporter, maybe separate agreements. And in terms of um, uh, ending an agreement and naming someone else, you could simply tear up the agreement and start over with a new supporter if needed. Or uh, actually, one of our attorneys said there would be nothing wrong with adding an addendum for a backup supporter if if the individual wanted a backup. Um, the benefits forms and what needs to be done when is so confusing. Is there an agency that helps support these? Yeah, I don't know for sure. Diane, do you know of an agency that helps with uh, the benefits piece? Yeah, if I did, I would be on the phone <laughs> with them daily. Um, I, I We did get some support from Ames Sill, which was our Center for Independent Living. Uh, they actually helped us fill out the SSI application and were very helpful for that. Um, you know, and then puns, you have your, but your case manager, of course, but I don't know. Um, it is confusing for sure. Um, I think you answered this is a legally binding agreement, correct? Uh, uh, according to the act, providers are to rely on it and they're not held liable uh, for good faith reliance. Um, can you have a power of attorney for finances and health in addition to a supported decision-making agreement? Do we say we can do that, Teresa? I, you know, and again, that's something I would want our uh, attorneys to weigh on. It gets a little more uh, into the legal weeds when you start comparing and, and using two at the same time. But but typically, again, uh, uh, you, you would use a supported decision-making agreement to assist the person with decisions and then maybe a power of attorney. They could sign a power of attorney now for the future should that individual become unable to make their own decisions. Yeah, Larry's was really helpful and kind of walked us through that. Again, it's not legal advice, but um, they actually have a social worker that will help kind of transition from a, from children to adults. Uh, our doctor was great and kind of coaching Erin with like medical questions, for instance, on how she can stand up and answer those herself. And one, one appointment we overstepped and we were just talking because we love our doctor. She saved Erin's life. So you get kind of close to people like that. And so we just started talking as we normally talk. And, and it was all like, yeah, you know, very, uh, very intense. And then it was like, okay, Erin, now you take over. And she was just like overwhelmed by our excitement. So they've been really helpful. And what she has said is that, yes, we could have a power of attorney, but it would be if Erin was in a car accident, for instance, or Erin, for whatever reason, could not make decisions. So really, like my husband and I have power of attorney from medical if we cannot make those decisions. Um, but it's not, if she is like right now, it wouldn't allow us to then step in. For instance, if there was a procedure and she just didn't want to have it and she, the doctors felt she should need it, we couldn't use the medical power of attorney in that case to say, yes, she needs to have it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, that's kind of the trade-off, but hopefully we feel she would understand the importance of that because she has been such a partner in her medical. 
career, I guess we could call it. There's a lot of questions in here about combining power of attorney with it. Um, so, you I, know, that's uh, I, I appreciate that. And that's something I think I need to take back to our agency and maybe get some um, a statement, uh, you know, a fact sheet or uh, part of our frequently asked questions uh, to clarify how that would work. So I, I appreciate those comments and concerns. And, and I will take that back to see if we can get some uh, information out to folks. Thank you. Um, can I get a copy of the slides? Um, the slides were attached to the email you got with the Zoom link for today. So that should be there. If for some reason it didn't come through, just send us an email and I will send those out to you. Um, let's see. Without full guardianship in the case of medical events, if my um, ID adult was hospitalized, he'd be unable to understand and make decisions and HIPAA law would prohibit my involvement. Would I need a power attorney for medical? To, to have a power of attorney, the individual must sign off and they must have capacity at the time to enter into a power of attorney document. So if, if it's felt that the individual would not be able to understand medical decisions, um, um, maybe guardianship is, is a possibility. You can also have a limited guardianship, which is very specific to a, a certain area of a person's life. For example, a uh, limited guardianship only for medical decisions. Um, and that actually, when someone has a limited uh, guardianship, they can make decisions about everything else. And, and it's not a statement of incapacity by the court. It's just directing assistance in one area. And then that individual, the guardian, would make decisions and have access to information, but only specific to, to medical care. I think you're on mute, Linda. Sorry, Sorry about that. Um, what's the best way to find supporters? You know, I would draw from uh, the individual they choose, but draw from their circle of support. It has to be another adult. Uh, it has to be uh, a, a person who meets the qualifications or is not disqualified because they have some of the things that I mentioned. Um and if people don't have that kind of kind, and I understand that, you know, we have people that we're guardian for, state guardian for, and we have uh, been thinking about, you know, some of these people might be able to get into a supported decision-making arrangement, but they don't have a potential supporter. So we're actually exploring that idea. It, you know, could we set a, establish uh, some kind of formal supporter program, you know, where we have some vetting of people who might be willing to be supporters for people who have no one. So, um, yeah. So one other question did pop up um, again about the, the combination of powers of attorney with support decision-making. Teresa, if you find out anything or yeah. I'm happy to, if you want to send it to me, I'm happy to send it out to the people who registered for today. So you can find out. You can also certainly reach out to Teresa individually through um, the commission and, you know, we can find it. See, I, I think yeah. there's a lot yeah. of people who would be interested in how you can maybe have some safeguards in place, but in general, try to let your individual, let your principal make as many decisions as they're capable of. And that's this, you know, Linda, you brought that up in, in terms of guardianship too. And the law says, the probate law that governs guardians says that guardians are supposed to make decisions that conform to the wishes of the individual as long as those wishes do not cause substantial harm. So, so even if you're in a guardianship, uh, the guardian should be relying on that individual for direction and um, and assistance with decision making. I see another comment about the agreement. It seems a little loose. It's not intended to be overly formal. It doesn't go before a court. It's a personal document between you know two people. Um, and um, yeah, they can literally tear it up uh, if they they do not want it to be effective any longer. No one has anything else. I think we're right about a couple minutes over. So thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to our speakers very much. It was really interesting, very informative. And um, we will be posting this video on our YouTube channel. So if you know others who are interested in, in learning about it or have questions about it, please send them their way. And 
I can also send out the slides to anyone who's interested who had not previously registered for today. So keep that in mind and, and thanks everybody for your attention today and have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks, Dan, Aaron.